Okay, there's two minutes past. Uh, we have 21 people in the room. So uh, I'm going to get started. People will probably keep joining over the next minute or two. Uh, I know this is Lynch University. We should probably be keeping the academic quarter, but uh, I'm just going to start anyway. So uh, yeah, thanks for coming along. Um, so the title of this presentation and the title of this lesson, I chose rather deliberately, both the title and the subtitle. Um, I want to make it clear, uh, you know, so uh, when I say idiot, <laughs> um, I'm being quite honest. I'm not a professional. Uh, I'm not a professional software engineer. I'm not a professional IT person, uh, you know, software developer, anything like that. I'm a sort of physicist engineer, whatever title you want to give me, who uh, writes a lot of code as part of my job. Uh, I write a lot of code as part of my hobbies. And I really like using Git. I think Git is a fantastic approach to uh, versioning, collaboration, continuous integration, uh, even just backing up your code, things like this. Uh, this is why I like to use Git. This is why I'm enthusiastic about it. Git comes with a fearsome reputation and uh, leads to a lot of people, maybe even for good reason, being fearful of it. Uh, you know, if your story with Git is anything like mine, you, you know, you, you started using it and you followed the usual, you know, you make some changes, you do Git commit and commit your changes, then you do Git push to push it to the remote repository, and then you just keep repeating that. Git commit, Git push, Git commit, Git push, as you develop your code. And then one day you decided to get a bit brave and you create a branch, or your colleagues created a branch, and you decided at some stage that you needed to merge it. And as soon as you merged it, all hell broke loose. Uh, you had no idea what was going on. You were getting, Git was uh, yelling at you about conflict and, you know, you were scared you'd lose all your data. So you did what is in the famous XKCD cartoon. You deleted the whole repository, cloned it from the remote and started again. And this time you just kept on the, on the well beaten path of commit, push, commit, push, commit, push. Um, I, yeah, that was, that was my story as well. The way I got over that was not by um, looking at, oh, here you can hear the ice cream van coming by. Um, sorry about that. Um, so the, the way I got past that was by teaching myself the low level stuff. It wasn't by reading the high level stuff about Git flow and all of these different workflows. It was really the, does anybody want an ice cream? <laughs> um, I really want an ice cream now. Um, it was by teaching myself the low level stuff, you know, what Git is actually doing with the bits and the bytes uh, whenever I did various commands. And that's kind of how I got over my fear. Then I started being brave. I started to realize that it's, you kind of have to work to lose data with Git. Uh, it's all in there somewhere. And there's normally a way to back out whatever mess you've got yourself into. Um, hopefully everybody can see my second slide now. If you can't see my second slide with prerequisites, could somebody yell and tell me? Um, but the prerequisites for this, I'm, I'm not here to persuade you to use Git. I'm sort of assuming that you've got an interest in using Git. You want to learn more about it. You want to get more comfortable with it. So you probably already have an okay-ish understanding of Git. You can kind of guess what Git, you know, you've used Git add, you've used Git commit. You've maybe even used init or status before. And you follow sort of a regular workflow with that. And you kind of know what those commands are doing. Um, I'm also going to, there's not a lot of slides in this presentation. There's like half a dozen slides or something. And then I'm going to jump into the bash shell and actually start working. So you're kind of comfortable with the bash shell. You sort of know what each of those commands will do. You know how to make a directory. You know how to look at the contents of that directory. The most advanced thing in here is, you know, the tree command, which draws a little ASCII image of the directory structure underneath wherever you are. I'm not going to make the very famous mistake of saying that, you know, it gets easy. It's just a directed acyclic graph of a content addressable file system. You know, it, it, it couldn't be more easy. Um, so I'm not going to talk about those things. But what I'm hoping is that kind of by the end of this presentation, you'll sort of have an understanding of what those terms might mean and why people say that Git is a content addressable file system. I don't think it's that important to know that, but you can kind of see once you get into the low level stuff, um, uh, why people talk about it like that, okay? So here is the view that every single Git tutorial in the world starts off with. Where's my little laser pointer? Uh, 
So uh, each of these boxes represents a commit. It represents a whole bunch of code, uh, this, the status of your project as, as you're at this point, and you've got the initial commit, and then you, you make some progress, and you have another commit. You make some progress, and you have another commit. Someone has the bright idea to make a branch, maybe for a feature or a bug, bug fix or something like that, and there's some work done in there. And in the meantime, this main branch master or development, or however you've decided to call it, it continues. And you merge, all hell breaks loose. Um, you lose a bunch of your work. A bunch of your friends won't talk to you anymore. Uh, and finally, you get it sorted, and then you keep making progress. Uh, this is how everybody thinks of Git after their first. They've done their first tutorial. Uh, there's this head reference that follows it around. This head is pointing at this commit. So whenever you were back here, it was pointing here. Whenever you were here, it was pointing here. And this is a nice way to think about Git. It's a nice way to think about the graph, a nice way to think about how your work is going, but it's not real. Uh, there's, you know, you can poke around as much as you like inside the Git directory, and you won't find anything that looks like this graph because there are some things. One thing in particular wrong with it. The thing that's mostly wrong with it is that the arrows point the wrong way. Git doesn't know what's coming next. Git only knows what's already happened. So for each of these commits, at every single commit has a reference to its parent commit. So for this one, its parent is this one. So it's pointing backwards. It doesn't know about the flow of time. This one's kind of interesting because it's got two parents. So you can immediately tell from, from just looking at this commit, as we'll do in a moment, that this must be a merge commit. These two are kind of special because they both have the same parent. So this one must be a branch. This one is special because it doesn't have a parent. It's unique in the whole Git history of not having a parent. So this graph doesn't exist. Whenever you see this graph produced by Bitbucket or GitHub or produced by some fancy command that you're doing on the command line, it's been calculated on the fly. Git is looking at the head or whatever branch you've told it to look at, and it's looking at its parent, and it's looking at its parents and grandparents and great-grandparents all the way back. Um, and we'll see that whenever we start to dig into the into the nuts and bolts of this. Then there's a level that everybody gets very excited about. Um, this is the layer where everything goes wrong, and um, it's the high level where you know you've made a whole ton of changes, and your colleagues have made a whole ton of changes, and you try to merge it, and it just it's just horrible. Uh, and this is where everybody gets scared of Git. I'm actually not going to make any recommendations here. I recommend going here. There's lots of other places, lots of other links you can look at that'll teach you more about people's opinions of this. But I'm not going to comment on this unless people ask me at the end. Instead, what I hope to do is that once you understand the low level stuff well enough, you'll be able to have opinions about what people are saying whenever they say use Git flow, which is the one recommended in this medium.com link. You'll be able to have an opinion about that. You'll be able to know where the weaknesses that is, where the strengths are, and you'll be able to form your own ideas. So this is the last you're going to see at this top level in this presentation. Instead, we're going to go right down to the bottom and look at a, just a single commit. So a single commit, I've got this little toy project here. Uh, this is the kind of thing the tree will draw for you, by the way, if you're not familiar with the tree bash command, this tree will draw this. If you do tree source, it'll you know draw this out for you. And you see inside here, we've got fname.txt, which is a file. We've got a subfolder called folder name, and we've got a file inside that subfolder called file2.txt. And we've got a commit that points to that. So this commit has this hex reference. The real hex reference is 40 characters long. You don't have to use all 40 characters here. I've just used the first seven in this little toy example. And if you go inside the commit, which we will do later, and look at uh, look at the contents of it, you'll see that it points to a tree. Okay, what's a tree? Let's look at that later. It points to a parent. So it's got a parent. Uh, um, it, it, its parent commit has this reference, and you could go and look inside that as well if you wanted. Then it's got an author with an email address, and it's got a comment where you know this person fixed a typo. What about this tree, A, E, E, A, T, E, D, blah, 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 blah. So if we look in here, and this is what it really looks like. You'll see this later. It's got something that looks like permissions, Unix style permissions, a blob, whatever that is, with another hex reference, an fname.txt. So it would appear that fname.txt is a blob. 
um, would appear that trees, copy an fname.txt and folder name, trees are just directories. And you can keep drilling on down and you'll see that inside this blob is a zlib compressed version of whatever contents is in fname.txt. You can go into that subtree and you'll see the subtree only contains one blob, one file, and also its compressed file contents. So this is it. This is what Git looks like at the very lowest level. It's got three different types of object. It's got a commit object. And that commit object points to one single tree object, which is the top level directory of your file, of your project, sorry. It's got tree objects that point to things beneath it, including any subtrees. And then it's got blobs. Blobs represent the files. So slides are boring. Uh, I've already taken 10, 11 minutes here. Uh, talking, uh, showing you slides. I don't want to show you slides the whole time. Let's go to the command line. I have to say that, you know, there's, there's, I'm not, I'm obviously not presenting anything new here. Um, a lot of the following is inspired by talks that this guy, I think Tim Berglund, he worked for GitHub at some stage and go and find his stuff on Twitter and GitHub. And it's very, very good. Um, but let's go to the command line. Um, so can you see my command line, folks? Can somebody say yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So here I'm in code git underscore lessons. And this folder has nothing in it. We're starting in a completely blank folder. So what I could do is I could do the usual stuff. I'm not sure. Maybe my keyboard's very loud on the microphone, but I could do git in it. Um, I could make a file. I could put some stuff in the file. Add the file and commit with some message. First commit. Okay, and this is this is how you use Git. But you know what have I just done, right? I've just I, I've I've showed you how to robotically type a bunch of commands, and there's no understanding behind those commands. So I want to rip everything out. Um, I'm going to remove that stuff and I'm going to go back to having a blank directory. Um, I want to give myself a little bit of space to work here. I'm going to create an extra couple of terminals so that you can see what's going on. So here I'm going to run the, I'm going to run the tree command. And, well, there's nothing to show and I'm going to run it to show all, including any hidden files. And instead of just running it once, uh, let's see, can I do this? I want to run it in a loop while true do. Okay. Sleep for a second, clear the screen, and finish the loop. Okay, so that's just going to have a continuous updating image of, uh, not image, a continuously updating view of, of any files and stuff I'm creating. Down here, I want to run git status, and git status is going to cause an error because this is not a git repository, but that's okay. It will be soon. Whoops. Ah, let's start again. Wild. I can't type. Wild. True. Git status. I'm going to sleep for two seconds because I don't want to call git so much. I'm going to clear the screen. So this is just going to show me git status. And whenever I start fixing things up, this will show me something better than an error message. And here I'm going to do something very similar, but I'm going to call this git lol. This is a, an alias I have that won't exist in your systems unless you make it that. But it, uh, it basically shows you a little ASCII map of the, of the graph of commits. Um, sleep for two seconds. Clear the screen. I'm done. Okay, so these three windows at the side will sort of show you what's going on as I make these changes. And here's where I'm gonna work. So it's not a Git repository at the moment. So we've gotta make a Git repository. That's normally done like that. But what magic is that doing? It's not actually doing all that much magic. We can make uh, a folder and you can see the folder appearing up here. Um, what else does Git need? We talked about how Git has a bunch of objects. Uh, Git has uh, commit objects, tree objects, and blob objects. So it needs a place to keep those. So let's give it a folder to keep those in. It's also got references. And lots of those references are the heads. So we can give it this structure as well. So we've got a place for objects and a place for references. 
get status still isn't all that happy um how are we going to make it happy there's one thing that's missing and that is that we there's no head reference we haven't created the head reference yet so hopefully you all know this way of creating a file if i you know hello and you know i can pipe that hello uh, into a file so instead of appearing at the command line it'll appear inside this file i don't want to pipe hello in there instead i want to give it something sensible i want to tell it where to go to find the head references so head refs master which doesn't exist yet but it will soon if i do that all of a sudden get status is happy Get lol, it's happy, there's nothing to show, but it's not complaining anymore. And my magical little um, hacker uh, prompt here has changed and said that we're working in master and everything looks good. This is basically just a little summary of the status message. So we've just created a Git repository out of nothing. Um, so Git in it isn't actually doing any magic. If I did Git in it, it would produce a whole bunch of extra stuff in there, but the vast majority of that stuff is never actually used. What I've got here is the basics. If you if I deleted any one of these things or changed any one of these things, Git would no longer it would no longer recognize that it's actually a Git repository. So now we've got a place to store all our work. Uh, again, I could go and do things the standard way. I could create a file and add the file and commit the file and change the file and recommit it and stuff like that. But again, that doesn't really teach anything. Git stores files, as I've said earlier, in the form of blobs. And a blob is a Zlib compressed version of that file with a, a hash associated with it. So it's a hash object. So what we need to do is create a hash object. Git has a command for them. It takes something that you want to hash and produces a hash object out of it. I can give it the command to write that so it can It'll take whatever I give it, hash it, and then write it. But I don't have a file to write yet. I haven't created any files that I want to keep. So I'm going to take it from standard in. So I'm just going to pipe something in here, um, in the standard in, and um, ask git to hash that for me and to write that object. So I'm going to echo something, whatever, it doesn't really matter. And since we're in Sweden, So hopefully the Swedes in the room recognize that. It doesn't really matter, right? I'm just echoing some text um, into the standard in of this particular command. And if we look at objects over here, it's going to create this object for us, right? Which it does. Um, it output the 40 character hex string that we kind of expected. And a 40 character hex string, if you think of the size of that, you know, the, the number of different objects that you can recommend, you can um, reference in 40 characters of hex, it's enormous. It's like number of, pro number of particles in the universe kind of enormous. So, you know, a crazy big number, Git has decided to peel off the first two characters. So, you know, to try and get some order to it. So a crazy big number divided by 256 is somehow manageable. Okay. Uh, but we can look at this object. This is an object on file. So why not have a look at it? Uh, F8, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, Zlib compressed. So we can't cut it the normal way. We can't just, well, we can't look at it, but it doesn't mean anything to us. Instead, we could ask Git to cut the file for us. All these commands, except for Git lol, by the way, all of these commands exist on your systems. You should be able to do all of this. Um, these are just all sort of basic level, low level commands. So git cat file, I want to ask what type are you? And I don't have to type in the whole string. I can just give it a few characters and it tells me it's a blob. Very nice. Got to give me the type. Can you please print the contents of that? And it's exactly what we hoped. So git has taken this input text. It doesn't exist in a file yet. We haven't created that file and create an object out of it. Now, the next thing we do, now that we've got an object, we have to somehow update the index. You know, we've got nothing to commit. You know, we don't have anything staged. So let's update the index. Uh, 
how are we going to update the index? Well, we want to add something to it. And we still don't have a file to add because we're doing this in this incredibly hipster way. But we can add the cache information ourselves. We know the permissions, 644. It's just standard read, uh, read, write, read, and read. Unix style file system permissions. Up here somewhere, I've got the long string, and I can paste that in here. Mangiala.txt, and I can give it a name. Okay, so I'm gonna um, add this to the git index. So watch down here this time. Maybe I'll not text. Watch down here. Git status should react, and it does. Um, we're still on branch master. We still have no commits just yet. But now we have changes to be committed. We've staged something. We've got a new file called mangiala.txt that's ready to be committed. Git is kind of having a bit of a fit at the moment because it sees that we've got this file staged, but it doesn't exist. So we must have added it and then deleted it. It doesn't know that we're being hipsters and adding this in this clumsy way. But whatever, we're making progress here. Um, so we've got an object and we've got it staged. You can't commit an object, uh, a blob, I mean. You can only, it commits, don't talk to blobs, commits only reference trees. So we need to write a tree. Um, simple as that, and that creates a tree. And we can ask, what are you? And hopefully this is gonna say that it's a tree. Yes, it's a tree. And can you please print one of the contents? So you see, I wasn't shortcutting earlier when I showed this in my presentation. It really is this simple, the contents of this, my permissions, the object type, 40 character hash, and file name. So now that we've got a tree, and I want to, uh, oops, copy that. And then I want to commit this tree. And here we should be almost finished with the committing process. We're going to commit a tree. What tree are we going to commit? We're going to commit the one that we've just created. And we're good citizens, so we're going to say first commit. Yay. So we put our little commit message in there as we always would. I'm going to create a new object for us. You see the object in the file system. This must be a commit object. Oops, this must be a commit object. 07CFF45, blah, blah, blah. Oops, I need to ask it a question. It's a, it's a commit. We can look at it. Yep, it's it's a commit, so it refers to a tree. And that tree is the one we mentioned earlier. It's got an author, it's me. It's got a committer, that's me. And it's got a message. It doesn't have a parent. It doesn't have a parent commit because it's the first commit. Like I said, this is the unique commit that doesn't actually have a parent. So we've kind of done everything here, but Git still isn't happy, right? Why is Git not happy? Why does, it's his new commit chip. Well, we just did a commit. Why, why is that commit not here? Um, the reason the commit is not here is because uh, of something that we did earlier. Uh, remember what we had inside um, git head. It talks to refs heads master. And refs heads master doesn't exist. And refs heads master couldn't exist at the time because we didn't know what the commit ID was going to be, uh, the, the reference in. So we can echo that in to dot git refs heads master. And now we've got a commit. And now you see git lol is producing some text. It's got a it's got a commit that was done two minutes ago. Um, we've uh, this is sort of happy. It's happier now, right? Uh, but we've got one change not staged for commit, and that's the fact that git still thinks that we've deleted Nangiala because Nangiala still doesn't exist. We're kind of empty here. So. How do we get Nangiala out? You can check out from the index nangiala.txt and it appears. Git lal is happy and git status is happy. Nangiala has the contents that we expected. 
So that's just the most uh, lead hacker hipster possible way to create a text file. If you think about it, what do we do? What do we just do there? We created a text file without ever opening any sort of text editor. We just echoed things in and out of various Git functionality. We created hex, uh, hex strings and Zlib compressed objects and managed to, and eventually to pull that out of it. Obviously, none of that's what you would do in real life. Uh, what you would do is you would use the high level commands. but now, now you, you can kind of see what's going on here. Inside object is just all the objects that Git is creating. There's not a commit objects folder and a tree objects and a blob objects folder. There's just objects. And all of these things, Git can query and ask questions about what sort of thing are you. And it ties them all together by references within the file. There's no other structure there apart from references within the file. And I think so. I think this was the, the blob object. I think this one was the tree object. And this one was the commit object. Um, all of these things exist on disk and will exist on disk kind of forever. So any sort of messes you tie yourself up in, um, uh, you can easily back your way out of it. Um, because these objects will always exist there. And there's commands you can use to resurrect things. So just to stop there for one minute, uh, before I go on to sort of developing this, are there any questions about that? I can't see if anybody's raising their hand or reacting in any particular way. So if you do have a question, just please be rude and uh, just interrupt me. Um, if not, I'm going to bash on. Um, I'm going to stop this. I don't want that loop anymore. I want a different loop while true do. And in this loop, I'm going to loop around because I'm going to create a bunch of files here. So for all files that look like star.text, um, echo the name of the file, cat a file, echo a new line. And then after you've done that, sleep for a second and clear the screen. So I'm going to create a bunch of text files in here now. And so this just sort of will, will expand it for you so you can see what's happening when I'm making all these changes. Uh, so let's create a bunch of files. Some interesting text. And we'll put that in file1.text. Add file one dot text. This is a much more standard workflow. And first file. I'm going to do this a few more times. I probably should have automated this, but I didn't. Um, I'll create four files so that we're not here forever. And third file, and then a file four, just so that we're, you're not just watching me do up arrow the whole time. And okay, so we've got four files, and you see the contents of them. And um, you, you can see my Git history developing here. One thing to look at, let's look at this hash 576CE34. Uh, let's print it out. 576CE34. Uh, okay. Um, it's a commit. We know that. But what I'm most interested in is this tree object FC68FF. So what do you notice about this? Well, it's kind of as you expect, right? It's got five lines for each of the five files. Um, and it's got the permissions are the same. They're all blobs. There's no subtrees here. But look at these hex strings. Right? These hex strings for file one, two, three, and four are all identical. Now, remember, these hex strings refer to an object on disk. So this object on disk is the same as this one, is the same as this one, and this one. Now, I'm not going to argue because it would be entirely wrong. I'm not going to argue that Git is somehow friendly to disk space. It's not. Git is horrendous with disk space. Um, but this is what it means by a content addressable file system. It's addressing these files by their content. And the only reason these are different files in your working area is because Git is interpreting this tree object. And whenever you check out this branch, it expands it out into this. Right? So these are all the same object 
on disk if you dig into the git directory i want to make a change um now even more interesting and i don't have to add it because it's already been tracked uh, file three is now better um there's something gone wrong over here come on there we go now it's better so now you can see file three is now even better so um this okay so here we've got a git history here and this is already pretty good what i tend to see what i and what i did myself is you know you do a week's worth of work and then you commit and the commit message is you know a bazillion changes or changed everything or um you know you just match the keyboard or something and um you know you do a day's worth of work and you do the same and that's fine you know that that's a fine way to use git you know these people i guess when you're using git like that you're really using it as a place for distribution and backup maybe for continuous integration as well but you're missing out on a real trick right you're missing out on something very very useful where you know imagine you're handing your code over to someone else or you're trying to understand someone else's code or maybe you're trying to understand your code but six months after you wrote it you know there's all the standard techniques of browsing through it and you know putting in tests and stuff like that but if you've written a good git history sensible commit messages you can use that because you can understand how the developer was thinking as they made each of these commits each of these commits is sort of a separate idea so if you just mash the keyboard or do you know reach worth the changes you you, you kind of lose that and that's okay but i would recommend you know much smaller commits this one on the other hand goes to the opposite extreme this one commits just everything you know the, the the project's nine minutes old and already we've got six commits and you know okay this one is a separate idea and this one is a separate idea but what's going on with these four commits here right you know you know committing one the addition of one new file after another you know just with not no other work being done that's really just one idea isn't it they added four files so what we want to do is really tidy up that history now if you've done git push and you've pushed this to a remote repository you should not change the history you should not go back and rewrite any of this because your colleagues will hate you and they will stop speaking to you if you do git push and then you rewrite history then you have to do git push force and that rewrites the history on the remote repository and then all your colleagues have to catch up with that and it's a bad idea once you git push you consider it to be out there and untouchable someone could have cloned it milliseconds after you committed it we haven't pushed yet so we can rewrite this what we want to do is to um, rewrite this history where we squash these four down into one and um, there is a command to do that we want to rebase rebase is like i want to you know and this minus i is interactive i want to interactively go through my git history from some fixed point i want to start off at, i don't want to start off at the beginning i want to start off at some fixed point and I want to fix all these changes. I want to update things and make things look nice. So what is my fixed point here? I'm going to go back to 07C FF45, which is just this very first commit. I'm going to say the first commit was right. Everything after that, I want to think about. So then I'm dropped into this, which may look a little intimidating, but it gives you all the instructions if you read it slowly. So if you read in this line these lines can be reordered they're executed from top to bottom so git is going to go through each of these lines and perform these commands it's going to pick this commit and it's going to pick the next commit the next commit the next commit and it's just going to do each of these commits in turn and pick is just the, the baseline it means use the commit don't change anything if you panic you can always do this just delete everything and the rebase will be aborted so if i just delete everything in this file and save it uh, exit the file nothing will happen but i'm not going to panic i'm going to look at this and say yeah i want to pick that first commit but i want to take the second one and squash it into that first commit and the third one and the fourth one the fifth one's a separate idea i like that one on its own but these three i think it's part of that same idea so i'm going to pick one and i'm going to squash these next three into it so this is going to be an amalgam of four commits I'm going to save that file. Then it gives me the option to 
update the commit message and just in case I've forgotten it very helpfully shows me this is these are the commit messages that you used before I'm just going to blow all that away and say added four files this is my new commit message for this combined squashed amalgamated commit uh, quit the file and you see it rewrites everything now in case you're worried I haven't lost any data everything just looks as it should but my git history looks much more sensible, right? First commit, added four files, and then improved the third file. And so this is a commit sequence that sort of makes sense if you're reading through the history. Now, you probably saw another few commands when I was doing the interactive rebase. So say right now I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, I really don't like file two. File two just sucks. I don't like the cut of its jib. I wanna get rid of file two, git remove, File two, blah, 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 git commit, but that's messy. Again, remember, I haven't pushed any of this stuff yet. I don't want to mess up my git history and make it look untidy. I want to continue the pretense that I know what I'm doing so that when my colleagues read my git history, they think that I know what I'm doing when I clearly don't. So let's back out. Let's, let's just reverse what we just did. So you want to reverse what you just did. Git has a reference log. Git keeps a reference of, uh, excuse me, Git keeps a log of all the changes in the reference. So anytime you change the reference, which isn't so much in this case, it's a pretty new project, there's 10 changes here. Every time that reference has changed or I've moved references around, it, this log will be updated. So I can look at this and say, yeah, I can see the first commit and the second, well, first file, second, third, fourth file. So this one, 90B576. I kind of like this one. This is where I want to go back to. I'm going to do a hard reset. So I'm going to change all these references back to whenever, back to whatever point in time, whatever period of history when this commit was at the head. Right, so I've backed it out, reset hard. I haven't lost any data. I know that's what people are worried about. Um, and my Git history looks like it did. So let's up arrow a couple of times and go back and do the rebase just as we did. But this time we wanna squash this commit. You don't have to use the full word. You can just use S, but this one here, I don't wanna pick it, I don't wanna squash it. I'm just gonna delete it. So now whenever it replays this, it'll add the first file and it will squash the addition of the third and fourth file into that and then do file three is even better. You see, I still haven't lost any data here, right? I've still got file two. I'm gonna save that and file two, I think at this point might disappear. It does, change the commit message, added files one, three and four. Save it. And now I look like I know what I'm doing whenever I push this. I got the first commit, I added the three files, and then I improved file three. So at this point now, I can get push and go on with my life, and things will be lovely. Um, so what do we learn in this part? This is the, I've got one more part to, to do, and I, I'm pretty much on time. Um, so in this part, we learned a couple of tricks. Uh, we learned what the, what the ref log is. Ref log just contains a complete history of everything that you've done that changed a reference. We uh, looked at git re, uh, rebase minus i, where we did interactive rebases in order to sort of change history and play around with how the commits appear in our history. And then we also did reset hard, where we reset to a point in time where we wanted to sort of almost like control C out the changes, wanted to get rid of the changes, control Z or control Z, depending on what you use to back it out. This is done with get reset hard. Okay, got 20 minutes left or so here and I was gonna go on to branches next. And does anybody have any questions about what I've just covered there? And again, remember I can't see hands going up. Um, you have to kind of be rude and just jump in. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, 
so branches we've got a master branch and we're on the master branch we don't we haven't made any other branches yet obviously uh, so how was the master branch defined well you remember this file we've got a master file in there and that's pointing to a commit dbf02 blah 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 this is the same as this one isn't too surprising what happens if we just copy that uh, to new branch git wow seems to think we've got an extra branch now which is kind of nice git branch yeah so branches are just files inside that folder that happen to point to particular commits and since i just pointed i copied it right this is just a, a copy commands it's pointing to the same place as master but now i can start making changes here um in fact i could even check it out but you also remember this file right what will happen if i just do that I just change the head instead of pointing at master, it now points to new branch. Save that. And git law seems to think we're now pointing at new branch. Yeah. So branches are not some complicated thing, some massive, you know, complex binary uh, graph theory, directed acyclic graph, mumbo mumbo. Branches are references, references that are stored in text files, text files that you can manipulate if you want. Now, I don't recommend manipulating it because if we go to reflog, there's nothing in there that says I changed branch. Reflog knows I'm sitting on new branch now, but it doesn't see me changing it. Also, imagine what would happen if master and new branch had a lot of different content. Whenever you just change it using a text editor like I did to point to go from master to new branch, that style of checking out, it doesn't actually go in and look at the tree object because Git wasn't involved in any of that. So it didn't go in and expand everything out. Instead of Git status would just panic and say, oh my goodness, you've got so many changes, you need to get your acting here. So don't do it the way I've just shown you how to do it, but do understand that there's no magic here. This is text files, uh, manipulation of text files. So I'm gonna go and back out what I just did. Um, I'm gonna change this to master, and I'm gonna remove, I hope I don't remove the wrong thing. New branch, and now get branch just shows that we've only got master, okay? So let's do it the proper way. Let's make a branch called title because the guys in the title department think that our nangiala.txt actually needs a title and then we check out title. Oops, git check out title. Yep. Okay, let's go in and change this. So anybody know the name of this book? Rather than a land character. Yep. Okay, we added the title and we commit it. Added a title line. Okay. Um, and you see here now, title is gone ahead of master. So while the title guys were working on that, the master guys noticed a typo in here. And I'm sure all the Swedes were just waiting to correct me to make sure. I got this right. Min bror Jonathan Lem kärta honom ska jag berätta. And commit. Say um, fixed title. And if you look at the git log, you can see that the branching is really starting to happen. Let's uh, let's keep it going. Let's add. Uh, the the third sentence there at nest and some men saga to good log log lead lead some spark historia 
box or that's enough um, added the third sentence and the guys back in the title department realized that the title should probably have an author Okay, so we've just done a ton of work here, um, added the author, and now we've got um, a repository here that's starting to look a little bit more like a normal repository, right? It's got branches and people doing different work, and now we imagine that the title guys and the guys in the master branch are happy. The master branch wants to bring the title branch in. So we check out master. I'm gonna clear the screen so I'm not always looking at the bottom of the screen. So we've just checked out master and we're gonna merge in title. So I wanna take the changes that people have put in title and I wanna merge title in the master. And um, yeah, yeah, of course. So auto merging, mangiala.txt, there's a conflict, right? Automatic merge failed. So, you know, horrible message. What do we do here? We do the standard, we delete everything and walk away because we panic, right? No, let's go a little more slowly. Let's look at the instructions, right? Uh, you have unmerged paths, fix conflicts, and run git commit. Okay, uh, unmerged paths, there's a problem in nangiala.txt. So, well, we can see nangiala.txt over here, right? It kind of looks a mess. Let's look at it. So it comes in two parts between the, this line here that says head and these equal signs. I wish I hadn't chosen equal signs from my underline, but anyway, between this one and this one, this is what the contents of head. And if you remember, head is on master, right? So this looks sensible. This is, um, the, the, this is the, you know, the first few sentences of the story. And beneath this line, up to this line, is the contents of the title branch. And it's got a title with an underline, and then it's got some text that's wrong. So we want to fix this up. So well, we don't want that stuff. We don't want that stuff. And we don't want the stuff at the bottom. And this title line with the underline goes up at the top. Okay, so we go in and we fix the merge, and we look at this and we check it. And maybe if it's code, we run some tests, some unit tests or whatever. And we make sure we've really merged it as we want to and then we save it so we save it and we run our tests so well now what use git add to mark resolution yeah okay so we've resolved the problem git add nangiala does that fix it not quite all, all conflicts fix but you're still merging use git commit to conclude the merge git commit okay now i can write a uh, uh, a commit message and merge branch title seems very sensible to me. I'll just keep that. And, and then it's done and it worked. Right? So here you see the two paths diverging here. And then we're brought together. And you see that nangiala.txt looks just as we wanted it to. Okay. So this is the way I do it. Um, if you look at my, uh, oops, if you look at my repositories, they kind of look like this, where you can see the branches. I like to see the branches and see the branches coming together because it shows, you know, you know, I've got you know two ideas in the go at the same time, where there's a couple of different people working on something at the same time, and then they're both happy with it, so we merge back in. There's some organizations, and there's some people who don't like that. There's some organizations who say, no, you're not allowed merge commits like this they never want to see this what they want to see is this perfect straight line where nothing ever diverges they just want to see a straight line up one branch or maybe there's two branches the develop branch and a master branch and you know they should never have they should never branch off and you know merge back in and they want to see some management of the chaos so what would that look like well we need to rewind history a little bit but we know how to do that I want to reset to this point where I added the third sentence. So 6DE2202. 6DE2202. E e okay. And here I'm back to where I was a moment ago with the, the sort of the fork in the road. So what these organizations like to do is to take a pair of scissors to this point here. And so this is the title branch coming up here. 
This is the master branch. Oops, this is the master branch here. Take a pair of scissors here, cut this off so that it's not based here anymore. And instead attach it here so that it's based here. So chop it off this 6BF02 and rebase it on the 6DE22. And um, okay, these commit hashes afterwards will change and you should probably be able to figure out why they should change, but the commits themselves, the details, the contents of the commit will be the same. Instead, they're going to be rebased onto a different base. So let's um, check out title. Uh, check out title and rebase onto master. So this tells Git to use the scissors here and rebase this on the master. And remember, we're going to get the merge conflict again because it's still the same file. It's still doing the same thing in the end. So we've got the merge conflict. We fix it up like we did before. Okay, now it looks as it should. We save it. We add it. We're still following the instructions here. Git add file to mark resolution. <clears throat> the instructions change a little bit because this is a rebase. We use uh, all conflicts fixed, run, git, rebase, continue. Another chance to fix the commit message, but this one's fine. This is the one I originally added, so I'm just going to control X out of that, and there we go. Okay, so now you've got a straight line. We're, we're sitting on branch title at the moment, and you can see it looks like we won. So now all we have to do is grab master, and bring it from 6DE22 up to 6AAEC, right? So let's work on master. And this is another merge. But in this case, the merge isn't going to create the merge commit as before, because there's no merging really happening. Everything in this line only has one parent. There's no branches here. So all this is going to do in effect, if you think about it, you can think what it's going to do. It's going to take the contents of ref's head master and it's going to edit it to point here. And in fact, if I dot git ref's heads master, and then I do git merge title, I'm going to merge title in the master. It was a fast forward merge. And you can see it did just what I said it was going to do. It zipped it right up there, move master up to match title. And now, we can clean up, we can delete the title branch, and now we've got a beautifully clean Git history. So this is what these organizations like uh, people to do. And in fact, many of them will have hooks in place. So this is what you must do. You can't make, well, you can make branches because you can do whatever you want in your local repository, but you can't um, push branches and you can't push merge commits. Uh, they will use the technology of Git to prevent you from doing that. Um, okay, so that's branches. There's one last thing I'd like to do, which is maybe a little foolhardy. Um, I said earlier about file two, right? File two doesn't exist anymore because we didn't, We just, you know, well, I decided I didn't like it. I wanted to delete it and still preserve the nice Git history. I still haven't pushed to a remote repository. So what happens if I decide now that I'd like to resurrect file two? You know, I could do that clumsy way, file two dot text. I could, I could do that and then add it and commit it, but I don't want to do that because I know it exists in the file system, right? I know it's in there somewhere. So how can I do that? I think we've got enough information now. We know enough about Git that you could probably puzzle it out for yourself. And what we want to do, looking at the ref log, this goes all the way back to the, you know, the very first, not the initial commit, but the first commit after that. Um, and I can see if I go back to here, to this point, 7A43B1, this is the point in time when I've just squashed all four files into one and then improved file three. 
So I don't want to reset. What I've done before when looking at the ref log is do reset hard. I don't want to do that because I don't want to go back in time. Instead, I just want to go back and fish around and look for information in there. So it's not a branch, but it's still a commit object, right? I could still check it out. 7A43B19. I can check that out. Now, this isn't a named commit that doesn't have a tag or a branch name associated with it. So Git might panic a little, but there's nothing to stop me doing that. And in fact, Git starts telling me, you know, you're now in detached head state. And just like humans, Git doesn't like to have its head detached. Uh, and this is sort of a scary warning. It's telling you anything you do here, you know, you could very easily lose. And you can see this is kind of weird. You know, I've kind of got this branch that just appeared out of nowhere. But let's give it a name. Let's follow the instructions. Oops. Uh, git switch. Let's see. And I'll call this rewriting history. Okay. So I'm just I'm sitting on this. This detached head state, and then I just decided to give it a name, rewriting history, so that you know I can I can do stuff here. And now, what do I want to do? Remember, the goal here is to kind of resurrect file uh, file two, and because I'm sitting down here, file two is back. Nangyal is kind of broken, but I could do the rebase trick, right? I could snip master, but below here, and stick it at the end. I can see what happens there. So I could check out master. And then I could rebase, get rebase onto rewriting history. And merge conflict again. Maybe not too surprising, but this time it's in file three. Right? And that makes sense because we did make some changes to file three. So let's change that. Again, it's only the stuff between these arrows and these arrows that we need to concern ourselves with. So the head has this line, which you want to keep, and the you know the the other commit doesn't have anything. So we get rid of that. We get rid of that. That's what we want the file to look like. Save it. Add file three. Okay, and then I guess follow the instructions. Git rebase. Continue. There we go. First commit, added four files. Rewriting history, do we really want our colleagues seeing that we do stuff like that? No, we don't. Let's delete that, delete a branch rewriting history. And now we've got something that we could push and still kind of be proud of. Okay. Any questions about that part? I'm kind of approaching the end here. I booked an hour and a half because uh, I knew I would go over a little bit, but I'm kind of almost finished here. Let's see. So what do we learn? Git consists of a bunch of objects. That's all it is. And they link to each other in interesting ways. The links aren't file system level links. The links are, and if you look at the contents of the file, and even as a human looking at the contents of the file, you can see what it links to. You can see that commits refer to a single tree, and then trees refer to subtrees and blobs and stuff like that beneath it. And that's just a way to expand out the file system of your project. Commits also refer to their parent commits. It can be a two commits um, if it's coming from a merge, normally a single commit if it's not. And in one very special case, there is no parent. We learned that objects are stored in compressed hashed format. They live forever once committed. I was able to resurrect file two seemingly out of nowhere. I, you know, I got rid of it ages ago and then I resurrected it. Git doesn't, Git occasionally does garbage collection, but the garbage collection is uh, just a, a stronger level of compression. Uh, so things live basically forever. They're referred to by their contents, sort of, because there's headers and stuff in there and not their name. So, you you know, if you've got lots of identical files, I don't know why you would have that, but if you've got lots of identical files, they'll only exist in the Git file system once. A branch is just a special commit. It's a commit with a name. Um, it's not really a line of ancestors, but that line of ancestors can be derived by following the trail of parents and grandparents. 
And head is nothing more than a reference to a commit. It's almost always a named commit because normally you're working on a branch, but but you can you know work in detached head state if you want. And checking out a branch just moves that reference around and populates the working directory. Uh, I think this is the very last slide. Yeah, activities that change reference, those are logged. Um, so there's get ref log. It's filled with information that can allow you to get out of trouble. I'd recommend looking at that kind of regularly, especially if you do a rebase or something like that, just to see all the noise that gets created, all the stuff that it does, um, and to get an understanding for how references are changing. Uh, one last thing I kind of want to show you here in the command line is I talked earlier about how Git is horrible with uh, disk space. So I've got five files in here, and you know the biggest one's 238 bytes. You add you add all these together, and maybe you get 500 bytes, a little less than that. How much space do you think this is actually using on disk? Um, Let's look at uh, du minus d1. And this is in kilobytes, I think. Yeah. 508 kilobytes being used to store 500 bytes. So yeah, we did a lot of messing around in this particular, particular repository. But, so a factor of thousand to one is not typical, but go and look at your Git repositories and you'll see that the Git folder takes a lot of information, a lot of space. And that was a deliberate decision with Git that the file space, uh, storage space is cheap. What is not cheap is uh, developers' brains, uh, the sort of human limitations and, um, um, you know, the human limitations of writing and understanding code. Okay. That's been an hour of your life. Um, I don't have anything else. Um, I hope that was clear. Um, anybody got any questions? Seems not. Okay. I see someone's writing in the chat. Um, is it safe to push rebases is a question from the chat. Um, yeah, because in, in, in rebasing, you're, uh, you're changing the structure of, so if you think of, of what a rebase is actually doing, it's, it's changing the parent field of particular commits so that it points somewhere different. So all of this stuff is dorking around with your, with your own history on your own local disk. It's, uh, it's not changing anything remote. It's not corrupting anything. So that whenever you do push it, it's pushing the nice, nice, neat history that you've created. So yeah, it's absolutely safe to push rebases. Um, just don't rebase after you've pushed. That's what leads to trouble. Any other questions in the chat or elsewhere? Okay. Seems not. Cool. I was crystal clear then. Wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time, everybody. I hope that was useful. And uh, yeah, um, I'll be posting this on YouTube soon. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot for your time. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks.